The Japanese attacks on U.S. military installations across the island of Oahu and the territory of Hawaii on December 7, 1941, is a familiar moment in our history. Our collective memory recalls aerial attacks against airfields, midget submarines, and the wreckage of Battleship Row. But behind bullet-riddled aircraft and the burning hulks of once intimidating warships was flesh and blood. Over 2,400 Americans were killed on the day of infamy. They were the first casualties in the opening hours of a conflict that would ultimately claim the lives of over 400,000 American men and women. For the United States, it all started here at Pearl Harbor 75 years ago. And in the years that followed, unfamiliar and exotic place names like Saipan, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, and Peleliu, they became topics of discussion as Americans of all walks of life followed the path of war from where it began here to where it ended in Tokyo Bay with the surrender of the Japanese Empire in September 1945. The next six episodes of The American Rifleman will be devoted to telling some of the stories of the Americans who fought this war. They did so with guns designed by John Garand and John Browning. They did so with guns made by Springfield, Winchester, GM, IBM, Frigidaire, and AC Delco Spark Club. They did so in the name of political ideals that we value to this day. So join us now for a series of special episodes that celebrate and remember the men and guns of the Pacific. Franklin Delano Roosevelt really had it right when he said that December 7th, 1941, is a day that will live in infamy. At the time the Pearl Harbor occurred, uh, frankly, the United States military, United States citizenry, certainly did not really have any sense that the Japanese were looking as intently at the idea of an invasion of the U.S. as they were. The sum total of that attack was that 21 warships were either sunk or damaged. 188 aircraft were destroyed on the ground. And then, most importantly, 2,403 Americans lost their lives, 65 of which were civilians. At 8.01 a.m. on Sunday, December 7th, the first of two torpedoes struck the USS Utah. The ship very quickly thereafter developed a list to port and began to settle at the stern. As men began to struggle to escape the stricken ship, Chief Water Tender Peter Tomich remained at his post, ensuring that they could do so. Then, at 8.12 a.m., 11 minutes after the first torpedo struck, the Utah rolled over, trapping men aboard. 64 officers and men lost their lives on this ship, one of which was Peter Tomich. But his actions were ultimately recognized when he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. The Japanese attack on December 7th is carried out in two waves. The first wave consists of 183 aircraft from the six Japanese aircraft carriers. They move into position and begin the attack a few minutes before 8 a.m. on Sunday, December 7th. And then, a little over an hour later, the second wave arrives, consisting of 171 aircraft. So on the morning of December 7th, 1941, you have two waves of Japanese attackers, 352 aircraft, and they attack American military facilities on Oahu, not just Pearl Harbor. What's truly amazing is that the training on the part of those sailors, soldiers, and Marines clicked right in. And you had men manning the anti-aircraft stations out at Eva Field, Marines cranked out the machine guns, set up heavy 1917A1 Brownings, and were firing at the Japanese planes as, as this battle's going on, just out of complete surprise. I mean, it was very quickly they were able to go into action. Even though it happened 75 years ago, you can still find evidence of the December 7th attacks all across Oahu, including here on Hickam Air Force Base. And you can see it especially on the front of the Pacific Air Force's headquarters building, a building that remains scarred to this day from fragments, fragments that were distributed by bombs dropped during the day of infamy. Want to know what's happening at American Rifleman? 
Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. We'll be right back. When we think about December 7th, 1941, we think about the loss of ships, the loss of aircraft, the loss of American lives. But today we also, of course, think of that attack as the event that provoked the United States into the Second World War. The day after it happened, on Monday, December 8, 1941, President Roosevelt, in front of a joint session of the United States Congress, asks for and receives a declaration of war. Bringing the United States into the Second World War after the United States had sought to remain neutral through several years of fighting. The American people largely wanted isolationism in the years before this attack on December 7th. The American people looked at the conflicts in Europe and in Asia and thought that there were no direct threats to American interests. And though at one point in time there weren't direct threats, those direct threats ultimately emerged and those direct threats to American interests ultimately reached their apex when six Japanese aircraft carriers launched 352 aircraft that killed 2,400 Americans on the morning of December 7th. This is why the United States enters the Second World War, primarily because it was provoked into entering the war. This marks the beginning of the war in the Pacific. On Monday, December 8, 1941, two Hawaii National Guardsmen walked down this beach to investigate something that had washed ashore overnight. They were Lieutenant Paul C. Kleiben and 20-year-old Corporal David Akui of G Company, 298th Infantry Regiment. What the two soldiers found was one of the five midget submarines that had participated in the attack on Pearl Harbor the day before. That midget submarine had not managed to find its way into the harbor, and instead, after its batteries expired, it drifted overnight, finally washing ashore here at Waimanalo Bay. It just so happened that the men of the 298th Infantry were at Bellows Army Airfield nearby, which is why Lieutenant Plyben and Corporal Lakui were sent to investigate. As the two men approached the derelict midget submarine, Corporal Lakui noticed a Japanese man lying in the sand nearby. It was 23-year-old Ensign Katsuo Sakamaki of the Japanese Imperial Navy. Corporal Lakui approached him with his M1903 rifle at the ready and quickly took him into custody. Katsuo Sakamaki was the first Japanese prisoner of war captured by the American military during the Second World War, and it happened right here. The experience of being on Oahu on December 7th, 1941, was a surprise and a shock to everyone. Of course, the Japanese had sailed across the North Pacific and then turned south to attack the Hawaiian Islands. They did this under scrupulous radio silence, and that was to maintain the surprise that ultimately accompanied the attack. The Americans that were on the island, then shortly before 8 a.m., suddenly saw Japanese aircraft in very large numbers attacking military installations from high altitude and from low altitude. You had aircraft like the B-5N Kate torpedo bomber that could release torpedoes from very low altitude, but it could also conduct level bombing raids from higher altitudes. You had aircraft like the Val dive bomber diving on targets in the water and also ashore. But then you also had the Japanese A6M20, which engaged and strafing operations at all of these various targets on Oahu. And so for the people on the ground, suddenly there are aircraft high, aircraft low, bombs exploding, torpedoes zipping through the water to hit ships, and then bullets from 7.7 .7 millimeter and 20 millimeter machine guns slicing into targets on the ground. This is all that's left of the A6M20 fighter that was flown by Airman First Class Shigenori Nishikaiichi on December 7, 1941. The 22-year-old pilot took off from the aircraft carrier Hiryu as a part of the second wave of the Japanese attack and strafed Bellows Army Airfield until his aircraft was struck by ground fire. Believing that he couldn't make it back to the Hiryu, Nishikaiichi steered toward the island Nihihau, 160 miles away to the west, and later in the afternoon, he crash-landed there. The island's residents were unaware that Pearl Harbor had been attacked, and they were therefore at first welcoming, but they grew increasingly suspicious of the young Japanese pilot as time went by. 
Nishikaichi ultimately received assistance from Japanese-born Yoshio Harada, and the two men took over the island briefly. After torching the Zero and then menacing some of the island's residents with one of its 7.7mm Type 97 machine guns, Nishikaichi was ultimately then killed by Ben Kanahele in the morning on December 13th. Although it's little more than a footnote to the larger story of the December 7th attack, the Nihihau incident reminds us that Pearl Harbor was not the only place affected by the Day of Infamy. From its beginnings on Oahu on December 7th, 1941, the United States commits itself fully to this war against the Empire of Japan, a war which the United States ultimately wins at a very high cost. We will ultimately see casualties and battles that will follow Pearl Harbor that will astonish the nation, leading ultimately to the last battle, the Battle of Okinawa, where we see American casualties reach their highest level. But it all started with the Japanese attack on December 7th, 1941, and everything that happened after that happened as a consequence of that. <laughs>